This is about psychological warfare. A specific type of warfare designed to distract, misinform, but trust me, trust me, and anesthetize the brain. We must remain vigilant at all times and be alert to their insidious attack on the mind. For they have come before and they will come again. What's good everyone? This is part two. As you can see, there's the serpent on the anchor, which is the first cross before Jesus. I got a lot of symbols here with the serpent being used, especially the medical industry likes to use the serpent or the caduceus, the rod of the Sclepius. This is the first American flag. I also have these family crests right here that uh, have the serpent. A lot of families were worshiping the serpent. Um, I got this picture coming up right here, which is Leo fighting the serpent and then you got the serpent chopped in eight which was the first eight colonies i found this picture of the serpent hugging up hugging a human and then on the rothschild's estate he got serpents um i found these pins you know with serpents in the cross and then the triangle with the cross that's a company called adder and then i found this serpent this is european and then of course more crosses with the serpent What's good, everyone? I hope everyone got to see my part one of religions worship the serpent. Now, this is going to be part two. But, you know, I try. There's so many corporations that have the serpent in it. Um, There's so many symbols around the world, like organizations or corporations or um, countries that worship the serpent. Now... People say the serpent is evil because that's what it represents now. But if you research, tribes all over the world, no matter if you're so-called white, so-called black, so-called Spanish, so-called Chinese, which and that's kind of like calling someone white or black. Because Chinese also has many tribes within that. It's like when you say call someone African, they're not really, they're from Africa, but they're from a tribe in Africa. But what I'm trying to say is snakes were used as symbols of, 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 of energy or a sine wave or the dollar sign, which it's used now. The dollar sign is the pole, right, with the snake going up it. And it also, like the caduceus, was used for the serpent representing electromagnetic energy the two snakes being the negative and the positive going up the spine and down the spine which was the caduceus and the wings are your crown chakra okay that's what this stuff used to represent then it got switched over to more or less worship of these demonic spirits or demons whatever you want to call it or just they change the whole true meaning of it, just like these invaders do to a lot of things. So let's move on with this article, man. The Viking Serpent. This article was written, let me just rewind real quick, July 9th, 2017. It's an update because the original article, let me see, where was it? Originally came out in 1990. All right, now I must be mistaken with something else. But anyway... Let's move on. And it was written by Harold Bokey. Bokey. I'm sorry, Harold, but I'm very bad at pronouncing names. But this is a very good article as far as ancient origins. Ancient origins. I'm not sure. Um, considering it says reconstructing the story of humanity's past. Hey, I've read this already. And I think there's a lot of good points in here, so let's move on. Because I know people, you know, we just want to get to the point sometimes. The Viking Serpent, Serpent Worship, Sacred Geometry, and the Secrets of the Celtic Church in Norway. 
Now, I put this video out also, too, because it has to do with where my great-great-grandparents came from and, and, and the large reason of why they left where they left. Um, I'm going to do another video on that, too, because people, you know, it, it, it's it's bigger than people just getting on a boat and leaving their country, okay? You know, um, it, excuse me, it gets bigger, it's bigger than that, man. Um... A lot of the people, I'm just going to go off track real quick, were lied to. Just like my family was. And sent over here to slave on the field. But we're going to get into a video of that in another time. I know people ain't going to agree what I have to say, but they're going to have to research. Damn, man, where's this plug? My phone's dying. Sorry if it keeps flipping. I'm trying to plug my darn phone in. All right, here we go. So, it says, Dan Brown wrote The Da Vinci Code, inspired by Henry Lincoln and his two co-authors, The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. The Norway researcher, Harold, was inspired by the same book. Lincoln's tantalizing bait was religious and sacred geometry, especially the sacred pentagram. In the opening scene of The Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown featured a dying man who had inscribed a pentagram onto his stomach with his own blood. Religion, sacred geometry, and suspense were the ingredients that kept audiences spellbound. But it was mainly fiction. That looks like that's in the tree, that pentagram. What Harold found, however, is non-fiction. In researching Norway's Viking history and Norway's conversation to Christianity, he was led to profound discoveries. These surpassed by far even the astonishing geometry discovered on the blood-soaked soil of the Languedoc area of southern France, where the Gnostic Cathars had been killed by the thousands of Catholic Church and Templars had many of their strongholds. So right there, it's saying that these churches were conquering lands, which were just like the governments today. So governments, religions, churches are all the same. They all work as one under that umbrella. A completely different story regarding Norway's conversation was revealed. Rather than the hitherto accept, accepted one, Harold discovered what is now called the Norwegian pentagram and other enormous geometric patterns with symbolic measurements constructed with the help of cities built during the conversion years from 900 to 1130 to act as markers. And lo and behold, it was seen that Norway had not been converted by the Roman Catholics as had always been accepted as has always been the accepted story. So that means Norway lived spiritually before these Roman Catholics came. Just like a lot of the tribes out, out in Europe were spiritual. People always think that just because we're so-called white or we're so-called from Europe that we're these soulless beings and, and, and we're all snakes. And um, that's BS, man. To me, we were all on the same page. And at some point, these conquerors decided to, to congregate together and conquer lands. All right? It doesn't matter what shade your flesh is. Astonishing discovery of sacred geometry and ancient symbols. The pentagram is for many mysterious, forebodying, fateful, and intimidating symbol. The Catholic Church must take credit for turning the pentagram from a symbol of sacred feminine to a symbol of the devil. The, pen, the, pentac the pentacle's demonic interpretation is historically inaccurate. It, has, it had many meanings in the cultures, tracing back in time many thousands of years. The use of 1.618 called the golden section or the golden mean and sacred architecture is prevalent throughout Europe. Pythagoreans considered the pentagram 
an emblem of perfection or the symbol of the human being. And the way you might say it is the fingerprint of God, the pentagram incorporates the golden section, 1.168. It is constructed using this number, and this number only. It can be said the pentagram is the visualization of the golden section, 1.68. And this is the exact picture I use in my intro because this is the pentagram. Five points of your body, five points of perfection. People say we're born in a sin in religion, but to me, I, I never believe that. Because the Creator, our mother and father, created perfection when they, my mother gave birth. Our bodies are perfection, man. If you think about how our bodies work like a car, as long as you take care of it, it's, it's perfection, man. Um, that's how I see it. All that born into sin crap. And, you know, the real Da Vinci Code. Vitruvian man. The proportional relationship of the parts reflects universal design. Since this number is a large part of the whole of holy geometry, it it permit it permeates creation. It defines a spirals of nautilus shell snowflakes the galaxies honeycomb it is in many ways the number of creation as it also mirrored in the properties of the human body after Harold's discovery of the norwegian pentagram enormous geometric patterns with symbolic measurements and ancient uh, spiritual sites in norway creating a pentagram across the landscape a larger mystery has now confronted him. Sorry, a larger mystery has now confronted him, who had placed the sacred geometry across the whole the whole of southern Norway. So as you can see here, I don't like the ancient origin sign. I wish I could take it out. As you can see here, they are connecting cities, and it kind of made. Well, it didn't kind of. It did make the pentagram. The Norwegian Pentagram from the Viking Serpent by Harold. So there we go on a larger scale. It zoomed out more. Who made creative with symbolic pentagram in Norway? Okay. The sacred geometry was not limited to the pentagram. Studying the sagas and other historical works led him to discover more geometry. Strange myths and fables that he had dismissed earlier suddenly seemed to make sense. Leading one, leading one exciting discovery after the other. The books, the Norwegian pentagram and its English translation, the Viking serpent came into being. Startling history, Celts brought Christianity to Norway. The research showed that the Celts brought Christianity to Norway. A fact that, at best, has been played down in our time of enlightenment. The important part of the Celts played in the, uni in the unification of and Christianing of Norway had been hidden be um, sorry had been hidden behind a veil or hidden behind the veil devil pulled down by the Roman Catholic Church as they maneuvered into position within Norway as in the rest of Europe in the year 1000 CE. Norway was still a heathen country, and contrary to popular belief, it was not the Roman Catholic Church that had struggled to convert the feared Vikings to Christianity. Abundant evidence was found that suggested certain groupings within the Celtic Church had converted the Vikings to Christendom instead. There were Gnostics from the Celtic Church, influenced by the serpent-worshipping Ophites from Egypt and Syria, who used the serpent as a symbol of Christ. There were Gnostics from the Celtic Church, influenced by the serpent-worshipping Ophites from Egypt and Syria, who used the serpent as a symbol of Christ. After Emperor Constantine in 325 CE sanctioned the Christian faith, which believed Jesus being the Son of God, 
the Gnostics, Arians, and o, um, Ophites, and other sects were persecuted and, and dispersed. The persecution of the Gnostics was mainly the work of the influ influential group that later evolved into what we call today Roman Catholic Church. And there we go. There we go. These are the same people that wiped out or tried to wipe out my Polish people. And I'm also a little German, so them too. I'm, I'm Polish and German and on my father's side, a Lithuanian and Italian. But anyway, the point is, Polish and German people are almost wiped out unless they convert it over. From the Middle East, the ideas and beliefs of the Gnostic Aryans and Ophites dissemin disseminated towards the outskirts of Europe. The Aryans went as far north as the Iberian Peninsula, while the Ophites apparently found their way to the British Isle, where according to the legend St. Patrick was sent to Ireland to guide the Celts back to the true faith. While there, he took time to banish all serpents from Ireland sometime during the 5th century, apparently without too much success. It is interesting to note that there have be never been serpents in Ireland. Patrick's feet, oh sorry, Patrick's feet is therefore all more interesting. The serpents he attempted to banish were probably bipedal, those of the Celtic church who reversed the serpent Jesus. And this is Saint, oops, what did I do? This is Saint Christopher right here. And what does he got on? Red, blue, red, blue, red. Blue, just like Republican, Democrat, Crips, Bloods. And if you put them both together, what do you see? He's got the purple um, behind his head. And he's got the green. Because I'm not going to get into that. But um, And this right here are, are serpents. That looks like an obelisk, which is a penis with a serpent going up it. And look at this serpent right here. It's kind of like old, but you can see it wrapped around. The snakes that St. Patrick drove out of Ireland were the Druids priests who had serpents tattooed on their forearms. Serpent altars from Cornwall, England and the Send House Museum, Mayport, Cumbria, England. Now I know I watch a channel. And this 5%er guy, he has serpents tattooed on each forearm. I thought that was, uh, now I kind of think I understand. But I would rather ask this person before assuming. Secret arrangements, religion, and, kit and king making. From the 9th century, Norwegian Vikings had settled in the Celtic fringe of the British Isles. From the Orkneys in the north down through North North. Uh, sorry, Northumberland, I must say Cumberland, Northumberland, Cumbria, and Wales, as well as areas in Ireland. They made new lives for themselves, mainly as farmers and artisans, a fact that did not exclude the occasional Viking raid. The heathen Norwegians came into contact with the Gnostic Celtic Church who from 935 to 1015 CE made secret arrangements and engaged in a joint venture with no fewer than three Vikings of royal descent intent upon ascending the Norwegian throne. The Vikings, king to be made, plans to unite Norway as one kingdom, so they infiltrated this Viking with themselves on the throne. In return... For Celtic monetary and administration aid, the Viking king gave them permission to pursue their own ambitions to convert the as 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 true pagans or as true pagans 
ancient Norse religion to Celtic Christianity? Hmm. The Celtic church was intent on using Christian magic to concentrate and conquer the land and its people, inaugurating one king and one religion. That sounds familiar. One world, one king, one religion. They traded their knowledge to how to pacify a rebellious population by introducing religion. They traded their knowledge of how to pacify a rebellious population by introducing religion, piousness, and ecclesiastical laws enabling their Viking mentors to ascend the throne and keep it. The Celts first made contact with the son of Norwegian Viking King Harald Fairhair, the young Hakan or Hakan. During the first half of the 10th century, Hakan was brought up at the court of the Wessex King Athelstan. And this is him. They're pointing at the king. This cat got his staff raised up, ready to hit him. I wonder if this is the king that's the traitor. Let me read below. Yep. So, excuse me. These old fights infiltrated, all right, just like they do today. What you see has been and always hopefully will not be, but these tactics they use, they've been using and using and using over and over. See, we think this stuff's new. Psychological war, weather war, this stuff has been used for thousands of years. Like I said, the school teaches us that this is fairly new and it's not. See, they keep repeating herself to perpetuate the lies. That's why when they do these resets, they, you always would notice they snatch the children up to perpetuate the lie. Because they know after a while, like people like us ask questions. That's why I think we are the Generation X. Late 70s to the early 90s and that's it, man. We're the people asking questions. And we need to not stop asking questions. And in my opinion, we need some unity. You know, a lot of people don't want to get militant. A lot of people don't want, you know, they want to do things peacefully. But let me tell you something. Things could go from peace to war very quick. So you always must have that mentality within you of being ready for war at all times. I'm not saying well, don't, don't walk in peace, but that peace could quickly come to an end, man. And I'm telling you through trials and tribulations, you know... Um, I'm always about peace, but I know in the back of my mind, someone else might not be, and they, and they might be ready to take war to me, so I always, always must be ready, I always stay alert, I'm always analyzing, I'm always listening, that's why I have two eyes and two ears, but let's move on. Monks from the monastery of Glastonbury had given Hakan this education, and upon the death of his father... Hakan returned to Norway and the Celtic helpers conquered the throne and began an enormous secret undertaking, which is not to be revealed for a, for a thousand years. So right there, that made me think like these people plan a thousand years ahead right there. So they've been planning ahead like that through generations of their family for a long time just to keep it going. After the death of Hakan in 961 CE, the Celtic clergy um, Cooper raided with the famed Viking king to be Olive Trigva Trigva and later with Olive the Holy. These three constitute the most renowned of the Norwegian Viking rulers. Sacred symbols six 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 in the golden ratio. Then the Celtics arrived in Norway. They found cities and monasteries as sacred markers. They and their Viking collaborators removed old cities that did not fit into the sacred pattern, just like they do now. A pattern that resulted in a gigantic pentagram stretching across southern Norway.
It was invisible unless one knew how to utilize the holy mathematical formula of the golden ratio. Only the initiated knew it was there, and only the initiated could trace it using the monasteries and the five medieval cities of Norway, N Nidaros, Tungsberg, Berjan, uh, Stavanger, and Hamar. The Viking Serpent Herald demonstrates how they were all laid down according to the golden ratio. Norway's two round churches mark the two extremities of the main geometric marker line. The resulting pentagram is inscribed in a circle measuring 666 miles in circumference. The number of the beast symbolizes Christ as a serpent. The number of the beast symbolizes Christ as a serpent. The number of the beast symbolizes Christ as the serpent, as shown in the Gnostics Nag Hammadi, text found in Egyptian desert in 1945. And this is the text. These texts describe Jesus as one of the called the as the one called the beast from the Nag Hammadi Library. The interpretation of the beast is the instructor. Who's the instructor? Hermes, Mercury, Jesus. Um, all these prophets that are so called prophets are the instructors. The fallen angels, supposedly, right? For it was found to be the wisest of all beings. Thus the Celts introduced the Christianity to Norway, leaving behind a trail of serpent imagery. The Celtic clergies used the number of the beast, reflects their occult use of magic and their refer, uh, reverence of the serpent. Now, when I went to Catholic Church and my grandpa died, first time ever, they would walk around with the scent burning and saying stuff in tongue, and my hairs lifted up on my body, and I didn't want to be there, but respect to my grandpa, I stayed. And like I've said in past videos, being buried in a box, right, and people can't disagree with me because I watched this, not only are you in the casket, but they lower your casket six feet into a cement block that's capped, which is six by six by six. Now your body's supposed to mix back in with the earth, but not only that, when you die, they cut you open and take your organs out. What's up with that? I said that in the past videos a few weeks ago. I don't want people cutting me open when I die. Just bury me in the woods so I can actually mix back with earth, man, and my ancestors. It's crazy, man. There's something about that when they bury you in the box and then they put you within the cement. Like, you're not mixing back in with the earth. I don't know what they're up to, but we'll find out. Serpent abound. The saga writer Schnorr Sturlson noted that King Olav, or Olav, the third ally of the Celtic Church, on his return to Norway from the British Isles in 1015 CE, used the serpent as a symbol on his helmet and banner, just like Egypt did. In an old saga, of which old fragments remain, the burial of St. Olive also reflects the number 666. The Stave churches, unique to Norway, were built during these times. Here's one of the churches. A lot of graves around there. I would love to go see that. It's in Norway. These churches were dedicated with serpent imagery in abundance. Wood carvings of writing of oh sorry. Wood carvings of writhing coiling snakes climbing the portals. And from all gables one can witness, even today, serpents raising their heads and play and and um, with playing tongues. Now, when it says snakes climbing the portals, I think these beings are from other portals, man. These serpent type beings.
Additionally, the roofs and walls of these churches are covered with wooden scales that seem to mimic serpent skin. And that's what exactly what it looks like. Another of many interesting facts regarding Celtic influences is that the coastline of Norway boasts uh, numerous large Celtic stone crosses. Norway is the only other country besides the Celtic fringe of the British Isles that has such crosses. Is that kid carved into it or is he standing there? Folklore reveals ancient connections. Interesting to the story of Celtic Princess Suniva escaping barbaric suitors by setting to sea in a frail Celtic wicker and hide craft. According to lore, she landed with her entourage on a small island on the fear fear fiercest part of the Norwegian coast and became Norway's very first saint. And that's her. On the same tiny and hospitable island on the fiercest stretch of Nor uh, Norwegian coast, Norway's first bishop bishopric was erected in 1060 CE. In 997 CE, the Celtic clergy and their second ally, the Viking king Olaf Tryggvason, founded the city of Nidaros, which was the capital of Norway for hundreds of years. It is interesting to note that Nidaros, which was the capital, oh, translated in the Gaelic language as meaning old serpent wisdom. That's what Nidaros means. Uh, Nadir being serpent and Ros being old knowledge. The sacred geometry of Norway does not limit itself to an enormous pentagram. According to old legends, a certain Norwegian island called Sandoy or Sandy Island is connected to Scotland under the sea. It just so happens that the northwestern upper point of the enormous pentagram falls upon a small island called Sansoy, or Sandy Island. On this island facing the sea, we find the Dolstein Cave, which has an intriguing history. Mist tell, or mist tell of treasure hidden in the cave, sought by the Orkney Earl Ragnvald in 1127. Even myths about King Arthur are weaved into the island lore. The sacred geometry and the landscape of Norway is so ingen ingeniously contrived it is difficult for us to understand how it was done. Certainly the builders, skills, and surveyors far surpassed anything historians have been willing to give them credit for. The Norwegian pentagram and the Viking serpent will undoubtedly prove to be important additions to our understanding of our forefathers skills and beliefs, as well as lifting the veil that the Christian church, historians, and archaeologists have lowered over our eyes. H Harold S. Bo Bowinkle, uh, Bo, 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 I can't say his name, was born into a Norwegian diplomat family in o Oslo, Norway in 1946, and has lived in different countries. His main interest his main interests lie in archaeology, history, and art, and shining a bright light on hidden mysteries. Harold is an author of The Viking Serpent. That's what I want to buy that book, The Viking Serpent. So let me know what you think about this, man. I found this and I dealt with it because it's from Europe, man, and um you know, I just want to prove to a lot of people that our ancestors were also in tribes, man. And um, they were invaded by these religious cults. But thank you for watching, man. I hope everyone's doing good and safe. Salute to everyone. Please share my videos, you know, and give a thumbs up or a thumb down. Like I always say, I'm open-minded. 
You know, I don't want people to kiss my ass. Someone said that in the comments a long time ago. That's far from what I want people to do. I want people to enlighten me. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Because that means if I'm wrong, I get to learn more and I get to learn what's right. I don't have any ill will towards being wrong. That's how I learn. That's how I have learned by being wrong. When someone says, Chuck, you're wrong, and I say present the evidence, and they do, and I say, well, damn, I guess I was wrong. Well, that's fine, because now I know the truth. And like I also said, I don't do this for views. I do this because I like talking to people. I like finding the truth. I like, um, you know, I don't like the GOV. Dot. I'm going to say that again. The GOV dot. People will get that. You know, I think, uh, you know, people are, are, are opening their eyes quickly, man, and they're catching on to all these lies. Or not just lies, some things could be, you know, uh, conspiracy theory, some things could be, what's the other word they like to use now, um, a lie or a fable or whatever, you know wink but salute to everyone man and you know i really don't know what else to say man i'm just thankful i am i'm just a thankful person nowadays in life and um unity is power and the people are the power man and so is knowledge salute everyone peace have a great day